Hello, uh, I'm Dr. Michael Byharry uh, from About.com. I'm About's health insurance guide, uh, and I'm delighted to be here today with uh, Secretary of HHS, Kathleen Sebelius. Um, nice to see you. Who's going to answer some questions from the About.com readership. Um, and I'll start, it's, it's interesting, our first question uh, sort of segues in with the President's announcement this morning about a patient bill of rights. Uh, and the first question that I had is how do you define patient rights and what is the impact of the Affordable Care Act? And this was not a setup. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, Dr. Bahari, first of all, it's nice to see you in Thank person. You. We've had a chance to visit a little yes. on the phone, yep. I think, in the past. We but um, nice of you to come, come here to DC. Um, we did have an opportunity uh, with the president today, first to meet with um, insurance company executives and insurance commissioners and talk a little bit about implementation. But then, particularly, the president rolled out a package of regulations which are being uh, released today known as the Patient's Bill of Rights. And they really deal with some of, I think, the most egregious abuses of the insurance industry and deal with giving some security and stability to uh, Americans who buy health insurance. So um, companies will no longer be able to exclude children with a pre-existing condition, and the president had um, a number of parents in the audience today whose stories uh, really compelled him uh, to help pass this important legislation. Um, we're going to get rid of the Affordable Care Act, gets rid of rescissions, the so-called mm -hmm. practice that companies use to drop someone's policy after they get sick, claiming that there was an error in filling out a form or some previously undisclosed health condition. Um, it, no longer will there be a cap on annual um, benefits or lifetime benefits. Again, when you think about it, for somebody who's really sick, uh, which is why you buy health insurance in mm -hmm. the first place, to protect yourself and your family from illness and from personal bankruptcy, the notion that you run out of money when you need it the most, uh, your chemotherapy treatment might have to stop or you don't have access to the medicines that you need, that practice will stop. And, and then on a kind of preventive side, um, women will have access to OBGYNs without having to go to a primary care mm -hmm. doctor first and being referred. Um, parents and individuals can choose a primary care provider uh, and a pediatrician out of the network, uh, not having to be assigned, uh, again, that very important relationship between patients and doctors. And finally, uh, includes a regulation which will make it clear that if you are in a health emergency and you end up, as a result of that emergency, going to a hospital which is not in network, you won't get billed mm -hmm. for that offense. Mm -hmm. In fact, if you're trying to save your life, we should congratulate you, not charge you more money. Um, all of those features really were part of a patient's bill of rights that was discussed and promoted almost 15 years ago um, by both Republican and Democratic members of Congress. It was never passed fully, so we're able, as part of the Affordable Care Act, to move those features forward, give families some stability, make it clear that if you pay your premiums and have a health insurance policy, it's going to be there when you get right. sick. You can't be cut out or locked out or priced out of the marketplace. And then patients will have some choices about doctors mm -hmm. and accessing care. Right. Okay. The, the sort of the flip side of that that I've heard from some of my readers is that they see that their rights are being violated because they have to have health insurance. And how would you respond to them? Well, I think think they're talking about the individual mandate, uh, which will presume right. that if you don't have coverage through your employer, if you, um, you know, don't have an option through Medicaid, that you indeed will have some personal responsibility mm -hmm. to carry health insurance unless you absolutely can't afford it. There is a hardship waiver um, for affordability. There's also a lot of help for people, uh, depending on your income category, but for everybody, below 400% of poverty, there's actually some financial assistance mm -hmm. right. to buy into the new market. But I think is, the issue is that um, 
individuals without health insurance now access the health care market. And uh, it's thought to be, on average, about a $1,000 tax on anybody buying health insurance that they're paying for all the uncompensated care. So you have a car wreck, you don't have insurance, you still end up being treated right. in a hospital. Right. Uh, but those with insurance coverage pay for that. You're often uh, not in as good a condition as you would be if you access primary care and, and health care. So I think it's, a, it's sort of a responsible way to say, Everybody has a share of this responsibility. We want employers to do their share. We want government to do our share. But also, we expect individuals to uh, be part of the pool. And, and you know, frankly, part of the pool is not just when you get sick. It's right. it's you know having this insurance coverage along the way. Right. Uh, talking a little bit about about the pool, the other pushback I get from readers. Uh, is the whole issue of it's great that um, I'll have my pre-existing condition covered, but my premiums are going to keep going up. And what good does the law do me if I can't afford it? Well, I think that's a great question. <coughs> and frankly, we have a couple of steps in this law. Um, the sickest individuals who don't have coverage now um, starting next year, we'll have access to a high-risk pool, actually starting this summer, at the states or at the federal level. So they'll have, and that coverage is capped, um, they'll have some opportunity to do that. Uh, but the real change in the insurance marketplace and when the so-called individual mandate actually comes into play is in 2014 with the new market. And the whole goal is to make sure that people share risk. That's what insurance is all about. You get sick and I don't, and we have coverage together. What happens right now with those individuals with pre-existing conditions is that they are segregated. We have all the sick people in one pool, mm -hmm. which is bound to be significantly more expensive than uh, others, and eventually drives them out of the market. Uh, they can't afford it. So the new marketplace will be some leverage. Small business owners pay more, not because they're sick, but because they don't have any market leverage. Uh, we want people to have the same choices as members of Congress. And putting folks in a bigger pool, making companies compete, and having some rules of the road with a medical loss ratio that has mm -hmm. to spend most of the money on medical costs, I, uh, over time, according to the Congressional Budget Office, is actually going to lower people's right. rates, not increase them. Now, with the temporary high-risk pools between now and 2014, given that a lot of the states are facing budgetary constraints, how are these going to come to be, and, and how will they be affordable? Well, actually, this is 100% federally funded, so we're not asking states. About 34 states have some kind of risk right. pool right, right. now. This is an additional risk pool, and the law says it has to be at capped at 100% of market rate, still not inexpensive, and mm -hmm. there will be people who won't be able to afford that coverage, but cheaper than most of the risk pools right now, and the federal government is providing this kind of bridge additional safety net for some of the sickest folks who don't have coverage at all right now. Okay. I'd like to switch a little bit and talk about access issues. Okay. Uh, and some people are concerned that as more and more people have health insurance, uh, we already have a shortage of primary care doctors in the right. country. What will happen and does the act do anything to help that? Actually it does. Okay. and. Um, a, a couple of things. First of all, uh, even though every American doesn't have a health home and every American doesn't have health insurance, most Americans can access the health care system. Often they do it, though, in the least effective, most expensive way. So come through the doors of an emergency room to get primary care. Um, that system will begin to change. But starting with the um, Recovery Act, there was a big investment that the President and Congress made in beginning to build a primary care pipeline. Uh, more docs, more nurses, more nurse practitioners. That was really enhanced with the Affordable Care Act, a lot more focus mm -hmm. on workforce, um, twice the number of medical scholarships being paid off, more members of the uh, Commission Service Corps, 
uh, more nurse practitioners, and most recently, uh, the prevention funds uh, for 2010, which again were part of the Affordable Care Act, the president really kind of insisted that um, $250 million additional dollars be spent on workforce issues. Mm -hmm. So he's been kind of focused on this from the beginning that it's great to have access to health insurance, but if you don't have a doc, you don't have care. If you don't have a primary care nurse, uh, we're going to have more nurse-run clinics. Um, but that would be the case whether or not this bill passed or not. Right. I think in some ways we're going to take pressure off hospitals, let primary care providers do what they're best at doing, which is treating patients before they get really sick. Okay. Um, I think we've run out of time. <laughs> I understand you have to rush off to a cabinet meeting. I'm, I'm so sorry. Uh, My boss has right. asked yes. me to come. <laughs> okay. Uh, I really appreciate the time, time sure. you spend and the readers at about.com will as well. Great to see you. Nice to see you. Thanks. Thank you.